to think about, you're, you're, you're talking about the drugs that, you know, you don't see a whole plethora of drugs that just aren't available after they've been developed. I think we need to also think about the drugs that never get developed. I'll give you an example. Polycystic kidney disease, basically it's an inherited disorder where you build up cysts in your kidneys and eventually you go on to have total renal failure. You're very familiar with it. FDA says that in order to demonstrate efficacy for a drug for polycystic kidney disease, you have to see how many patients go on to have renal failure versus, let's say, a placebo instead of looking at cyst formation. But the problem is it takes 30 years to develop renal failure as a result of polycystic kidney disease. If you could use a reduction in cyst formation as the endpoint in the trial and show that a new drug reduces the formation of cysts, it seems intuitive you're not going to progress as quickly to renal failure. But they want you to look for the, out, the clinical outcome, renal failure, and guess what? Companies have walked away from developing drugs for polycystic kidney disease. So there's drugs just as simply aren't being developed, and that's what I worry most about. It's not the drugs that are getting licensed in Europe and not here. It's the ones that simply aren't being developed. Okay, another question? I would love to hear a female voice tonight. <laughs> Somewhere. Am I, I, thank you. Maybe if, if I'm just not seeing it, thanks. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm Sarah and I'm actually a practicing physician. And I want you to know in this age of evidence-based medicine and also my concern about suggesting that my patients take a certain medication. How would I know, one, that this, patient, that this medication is efficacious, and two, that I'm not doing my patient any harm? I want to be able to know what the side effects of a certain medication may be, and I want to know how I might monitor a, a patient for identified side effects. Doctor, so can, you, can you focus if, that actually into the form? And I know you can. So question. if every drug were fast-tracked or allowed to be sorted out, how could a physician present a medication to a patient as being something that will help them and not harm them? Um, do, Scott I, or Peter? I, 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 I would, Peter I, Huber. I, I'll, I'll tell you what the very best systems are out there today, to my knowledge, OK? Um, and they are the ones that have, unfortunately, not mainly during the FDA trials, but post-market, OK, accumulated huge databases of massive amounts of molecular data and clinical data. IBM is pioneering some of this work. Their HIV computers outperform doctors. You, you give a patient profile, the you know, route of entry, the, uh, what country you're in, these things, and, the, uh, and they, are, they are doing massive searches through very large amounts of molecular data, and, and they give you precision, custom tailored, uh, the, the best possible prescriptions you can get. You get those prescriptions only when you've accumulated a lot of patient-specific data and a lot of clinical data. We should start doing that during the, the FDA clinical trials. We don't. And the question presupposes. Um, this is just because the doctor, of the doctor's expertise, and then I'll come back to you, Scott. I just want, if the mic is still with you, does, yes. did, the, did the answer Peter give you actually, is it something that you can work with? Well, no. <laughs> Why? Because, um, Medications, I think, are prescribed, um, and I need to know, and my area is rheumatology, and there are a lot of wonderful, magnificent drugs that have come out in the past 10 years that have changed my patients' lives. But many of these drugs have very bad side effects or potential side effects. That you feel and, you wouldn't know about. And I wouldn't know about okay. that. All right, let me, and, let, me, let me then stop okay. you there and yeah, let Scott, I, I Scott I leave the, come in. The question presupposes that we actually know a lot about the drugs that go through the full-blown uh, clinical trials versus the ones that go through the, the accelerated approval. And I would say that we don't. There's a lot that we don't know. And to, to, pick, on, to pick up on your field, what do you think would happen if we did randomized every NSAID on the market to placebo and did a 10-year cardiovascular outcome study? Do you think that some of those NSAIDs would show the same cardiovascular risk that was shown with the Vioxx, which Dr. Avon talked about? I suspect that they would. We don't know about the latent cardiovascular risk with most drugs on the market because we haven't looked for it, and we never will because it's impractical and impossible to do that study. So the advice I give patients and take for myself is if I'm taking a drug, I make sure I really need it. I want to remind you we are in the question and answer section of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate. I'm John Donvan. We have four debaters, two teams of two, fighting it out over this motion. The FDA's caution is hazardous to our health. Let's go to some more questions, ma'am. Blue uh, turquoise. Uh, my name is Kathleen. I'm sorry. Could you repeat because your mic wasn't on? Thanks. Okay. My name is Kathleen. And my question is in reaction to something that Dr. Huber said uh, that 
certain drugs can be approved by the FDA, put on the market, and then doctors can prescribe cocktails of these drugs to their patients, to, you know. And now since a medical doctor is neither a chemist nor a pharmacologist, is this a wise practice? Well, let me put it this way. If, uh, if, if you uh, outlawed it, as some people suggest we should, or actually crack down, and by the way, under the federal drug law, it's quite clear doctors have a right to do to practice off-label medicine, but oncology would essentially shut down if you, if you actually prohibited this. Oncology is all toolkit. All is not true, but some of the, script, the, the cocktails go through FDA licensing scripts. The vast majority of oncology today is doctors looking at drugs that have a particular uh, molecular medicine uh, a mechanism are known, they understand, gee, if I do this to the, the breast cancer cell, I'll whack this receptor, and, and they're sequencing the tumor at multiple points in the body, and they're finding all sorts of different ways to attack it, and they're assembling, that's how they do it. Uh, there's some areas you just have to do that. Okay? Is this ever done in areas other than oncology? Yeah. Look, look, uh, look, many people my age and, and others, you know, are taking fistfuls of drugs all the time. I mean, it's... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let me uh, move on to the question, sir. Does yeah, that uh, explain uh, it, Peter? Right in the center there. Uh, my name's Gary Marcus. Um, I have a question that's primarily for Peter, but I'd like to hear everybody's uh, response. Uh, it's prompted by your remark about Bayesian statistics. I've been trying to work about out what, what um, about particular kind of statistics. It was prompted by Bayesian. his view about statistics, but I'll, I'll make the question so you don't need to know the term. I'm trying to work out what your view is, and one view that I could imagine is we get really large databases, we get Watson on the job, and then everything is entirely in the discretion of the doctors. Is that the model that you're pushing, and if not, why not? I, I think, to tell you the truth, and I, I don't necessarily want to go here, I, do, I, I think I am quite confident that in, in our lifetimes with this massive convergence of digital and biochemical technology and our ability to acquire all this data, we will get increasingly personalized, we will get to the point where the information is there where the, the, the people best qualified to decide how to pre prescribe one or more drugs to this patient will be the doctor and patient because you've got a unique body there, you have a massive record of how things connect to each other, and, and, and Bayesians know how to draw those networks. They're doing but, it but are the doctors yeah. good I, I enough reason? I want to interrupt this, ask Peter Huber a question show, um, to let the other side answer the question. Okay. Jerry Avorn. Um, there, there's a tendency to believe that we can do anything with big data and that if we just let anyone use any chemicals they want and have a big enough database and a powerful enough computer, it'll all kind of come out in the wash. Um, and I, I know a little bit about that because that's the kind of research we do in my division and it doesn't work like that. Um, the reason that we've had clinical trials of the randomized kind for the last many decades is that that's a very powerful tool for learning what works and what doesn't. And saying we'll just observe a whole lot of people and see how they do is not going to give us the answer. I think the physician's question is a really key one. The time that we get information about how well a drug works and what its side effects are is heavily centered on the FDA evaluation and the studies the companies bring to the FDA. If we shortcut that, we lose the opportunity to really understand the question that physicians face every day. How well does it work and how well um, can I trade off those benefits for the risks that I know that it might also cause? And if we don't collect that information, we're all just kind of shooting blind when we prescribe those drugs uh, in the future. Okay. Okay. Uh, Pete, well, celebrity Pete Dominic. <laughs> celebrity Pete Dominic, I'd like to direct my question to uh, Jim and ask him who he's voting for. But uh, <laughs> um, I guess uh, for me, the most uh, interesting thing to come out of this tonight what, that I've learned is that uh, the FDA uh, receives a salary funded by the agency of which it's supposed to police. Um, I think that's disconcerting to most Americans that our regulatory agencies are. are captured the SEC by Wall Street, the, uh, you know, the EPA perhaps in the last administration with oil. I would, is this not a concern for us? Why would we allow the pharmaceutical industry or any other medical industry to uh, finance the salaries, subsidized salaries of those who are okay. supposed to be policing it? Scott Gulley first, is it accurate? Well, look, there's a lot of federal... Is it, is it, is it an accurate portrayal? Is it accurate what, that the, that the FDA is captured by the industry because the user fees help fund... Well, you don't necessarily need to use that language, but the... <laughs> No, no, it's not accurate. I mean, there's a, there's a long precedent of user fees being used to help offset the costs of government agencies, state agencies, federal agencies. There's other models for it in the federal government. 
you're paying really for the review times, the review process, you're not paying for the outcome. And I think that there's something to be said for the industry that's regulated, sitting down periodically with the agency that regulates it to talk about how that process is working and to help talk about how funds can be provided to improve how that process is working. Uh, there, this, this actually works. And if you look back at the original PDUFA legislation, written into that legislation was language from Congress describing to FDA how to hold a meeting. Now, I would say FDA's management and the management of the drug review process is a whole lot better today as a result of the user fees, and they don't need instructions from Congress anymore on how to hold a meeting. But that's the way it was back then, and the user fees are a big reason that the management of that agency has improved so much. With this, I'd like to respond.